Ah, see, now we know it's being recorded. But, you know, um, I have this little thing up here that says recording, but it's so little, you know, I mean, I need something that's flashing that says on the air or something it's like being, that. being recorded. Yeah, yeah. See, like that. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's good to have you all here together. As we know, last week, we started a minor prophet study. And in this case, we're looking at the small book of Joel. It's only three chapters long. But the reason I think we're going into this is because I, we need to understand how God works and that God's messages and his prophecies have bearing then and now, you know, and in the future. I mean, these messages have value that we need to be aware of and be looking toward in what's going on in the world. I've always said that where current and future prophecy is involved, always look to Israel. Israel is the spark that will set off any of these few current or future prophecies that are going to happen. Israel's going to be central in it all. So when you see these events happening in the world, especially where Israel is involved, take note of what's going on. Because I guarantee you that at some level, it's fulfilling prophecy, even now today, when you see Israel involved in situations like what they're going through right now with Hamas. Now, as we looked at uh, the first 12 verses of Joel chapter 1 last week, what we find is that Joel is giving a warning. And now he uses uh, metaphor and symbology and things like that. He talks about the locust swarm that's coming. He's talking about these different things that fit within locusts. Now, that's most likely symbolism. Now, some could say, well, wait a minute. And when the 10 plagues happened to Egypt, wasn't there a swarm of locusts? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's always possible that it could be actual. And the only way you're going to know is when it happens. But within those verses, he talks about a nation. So this swarm of locusts could be a, a military force coming against them. Because you know how it says that locusts fly in uh, order and in formation? Well, in a sense, it kind of is a metaphor for like an army. You know how armies come like in formation and that kind of thing. But, you know, I mean, to be able to say unequivocally that it is exactly what's going to happen is really tough when you're dealing with prophecy. When you look at Revelation, for instance, I mean, if you go look at all the commentaries that are out there on Revelation, and these are, and many of them are from notable, very trusted scholars you'll find that most of them have their own interpretation and not all of them agree. I mean, they see the symbolism and the actual, you know, content differently than maybe a brother or a sister or somebody else that is also in trying to interpret the prophecy. So, I mean, we have some really good people out there doing prophecy things like uh, Dr. Jeremiah. I mean, he speaks, you know, on prophecy quite frequently. Uh, he comes, you know, from the lineage of uh, Tim LaHaye. You you remember Tim LaHaye, the one that with Jerry B. Jenkins, they wrote the Left Behind series. Well, he took over for Tim LaHaye at Shadow Mountain. So they both have pretty much the same views in their interpretation of end times prophecy. Well, in this case, what we're looking at with Joel is he's warning the Jewish community, the Israel, Israel as a whole. He's warning them of something that's going to come or that will be coming maybe more than once over time of something that's against the Jewish people, the Israelites. Now, what we have to understand about the Jewish people, and we'll see in tonight's part of the study, one of the things that always got the Jews in trouble was when they turned away from the Lord, right? As they turned away from the Lord, they went after other gods, 
that's when God would bring problems on them. And many times he, especially if you go read the judges, you know, like in the judges, the, the book, what you find is as they turn from the Lord, God allowed nations to come in and conquer, them, to come in and, you know, basically put them under submission. And then they would call to God and God would, you know, see that they finally were repenting and he would bring them a savior, a judge to help them and free them from the oppressing forces that had come in. Um, so you see the Assyrians, the Midianites, uh, and and other nations that would come in and uh, attack them. And God was allowing that because they would stray and go after other gods and do things their own way. Well, some people would say, well, wait a minute, that was just back then. Be careful what you say about the Bible when you say, oh, that only applied back then. You'd be surprised how many evangelical or Christian churches today are making that statement as part of their, uh, I guess you might say, the, the Bill of Rights for their church. They're saying things like that. They're saying, oh, that applied in the Old Testament, but it doesn't apply today. And uh, they start that mindset when they say, oh, but the law was only then, the law isn't today. And I would agree with that statement in principle. Because Jesus died on the cross, he took the law unto himself. We see that in Colossians, right? Well, I understand that. But also, Paul says that the Old Testament was there as an example for us. In other words, it's something we should look back on to un get to understand God better and understand certain things that still apply to us today within it, especially those things that are of moral value or those things that fit within God's order of things for humanity. And as you know, I think you would accept the statement that, hey, don't you think the creator knows what's best for his creation? Don't you think he would be the right one to tell us how best to live out our lives since he's the one that gave us life? Don't you think he's the one that is the best one to order our steps in a way that would be advantageous, even in a fallen world? My answer to that is, I, I'm, I would say yes. But see, this world has attractions, right? And we see that with the Jewish people over time in the Old Testament, especially, that they were attracted by what the other nations had. They wanted what the other nations had, including their gods. And they wanted to be like them. And because of that, by doing that, they would relegate God either to, uh, you know, third, fourth, fifth, tenth place or whatever. They wouldn't fully cast God out, but they weren't following him explicitly. Right. Like the Ten Commandments said, were they supposed to have any other gods before them? No, the Ten Commandments made it clear he was the only one. Right. And. When you look at that and you realize that, you know, I mean, they went their own way and they did their own thing, there were problems. Well, guess what? Do you think that that was the only time that that happened? I would, I would venture to say that what you see, what is happening in Israel today is no different. The, is Israel as a whole following God these days? No. As a matter of fact, it's a, a very small minority that truly is following God in Israel today. If you look at the at at the statistics of you know basically what people believe in Israel today from a religious standpoint, you find that a majority of them are atheistic. And you would say what? How can the Jews, who have such a rich history, biblically, with God, be atheistic today? You know, it's like, what? What is going on? Human well, nature, Ted. Human nature doesn't yeah, change. Yeah, it is, brother. I'm, well, look at our nation. We're not doing a whole lot better ourselves, right? History repeating <laughs> again and again. It's, it's a sad thing. Yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. 
So going back to the Old Testament, uh, we have to distinguish between you know the uh, the laws that uh, God gave specifically to Israel, right, and the moral law that was given to them that transcend yeah. time. In other words, they still apply to us. Yeah, like, the, like you know the commandments: Amen. Thou shalt not steal. Well, we could say, was that only for Israel? Right. Thou shalt not kill. What still applies today? So those moral laws yeah. are still co convey to us. They still yeah, are functional. Us. Yeah. Yes. They they are they are relevant, not irrelevant, irrelevant, but relevant to yeah. today's uh, time. Amen. And that's what I'm talking about. And what things still apply today? I mean, there are certain things that God gave the Jews then that applied all humanity today to make life better for humanity. Think about what Martin just said. If nobody killed anybody else, do you think we'd be in a better position, you, you know, in relating to human beings and having better relationships? I would think so. If you're not stealing from your other people, don't you think that that would make for better relationship between you and other people? I would think so. If you're not jealous of other people, don't you think, or envy other people, don't you think that that would make for better relationship building? I would think so. So, I mean, when you look at things like that, that were in just some of the issues in the Ten Commandments, you can see that mankind would be a lot better if they could even just adhere to those fundamental moral values that really transcend, you know, the, the Jewish people and transcend time. Just like Martin's saying, I mean, it's, it's like, Lord, help us. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what it comes down to. But now uh, going back into Joel, remember last week we talked about that Joel was warning these people of what was to come. Now, like I said last week, we don't have a lot of background on Joel as an individual. We know that this was probably written sometime around 600 to 900 BC or 6 to 700 BC, somewhere in that time frame. But it still is warning the people of a nation that was going to come in basically to bring them under subjection. And so, uh, and it, uh, like I said, we went through all the those things that were more metaphoric or symbol, symbolic in terms of the way Joel was presenting it. And we're going to see that, okay, now the warning was there in verses 1 through 12. And we're going to pick up in 13 and see where the prophecy goes with reference to the warning. Okay, what's next? Okay, if the warning's in place, what do they need to do about this warning that's been given to them as a nation? What are they going to do about it? You know, those are the things that we want to talk about. And then we'll also want to talk about if they adhere to that warning then, how would they do it today? Does it still apply today? Is there still an issue with the Jewish people that is still pervasive in their nation today? Is it still the same mindset, or I guess you can say heart set, that the Jewish people have today that the Jews had way back then when Joel was the one who gave the warning, you know, that God had him give this warning to the people? So we're going to look at that, and then if they don't obey the warning, what happens? You know, if if they dismiss the warning and just say, ah, oh, that's just a bunch of rhetoric, we don't need to really observe that, then what happens? What comes about, you know, when people just say, no, nah, it's not necessary. We don't need that. You know, that's old school. We, we're, a, we're a more intelligent people today we're we're up with the times we don't need that old warning stuff that's you know that's there and gone well guess what we're still seeing the same results of the warning in israel today and that's why i can ask the question does prophecy carry through more than just one event you know, is it just one event or is it multiple events? Could it be progressive events? Is the heart problem uh, some something, if it's continual, will God continue to try to get their attention 
through whatever means, you know, these nations bring against them. We'll talk more about that. So any questions, uh, comments, agreements, disagreements on the introduction before we pray and jump into the scripture? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together and study you with you. I pray, dear Holy Spirit, that you would just open our, our eyes and minds to the words you have here. Help us to understand it in the way you intended it, Lord God. We don't want to fabricate something out of your word. We want to be able to accept it and understand it exactly as you intended, Lord God, because the word is from you and your word is truth. So, Lord, give us insight, I pray, and just let us have a good time as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let me share out uh, the scriptures here through my Logos account and see what we got going. If I can share it. Okay, where is it? There it is. And here we go. Okay, um, like I said, we got down to verse 13. Um, but let me just read some of this because I mean, what we looked at last week, because I mean, when you think about it, I mean, it, it almost makes no sense, right? Um, because we see things like, let me just, I'm just going to read straight through to verse, uh, 12. Yeah, Aaron, go ahead, brother. Yeah. yeah I, I thought I could get a better translation. So I, I went got away from the ESV and went to the uh, living, was it living, Trans living translations? Living translations? Uh-huh. It's not, that's not any better. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, brother. So, yeah, because, I mean, it's prophecy, and I, there isn't prophecy. If it's already fulfilled prophecy, you can kind of understand what the prophecy was saying and how it was fulfilled. But when it hasn't been fulfilled, it's a lot harder to lo look at it and say, what are they saying? You know, <laughs> kind of like what Aaron's saying. I decided to check out different translations and figured it might be better, but not so much. But uh, anyway, I'm going to read from verse 2 on to 11, just so that you hear. And it kind of fits within what I've already talked about in the introduction. But listen to what he says. Hear this, you elders. And now he's talking to the people of the land, the ones that are in charge, okay? Hear this, you elders, give ear all inhabitants of the land. Has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. And that goes back into Deuteronomy chapter six, the Shema, you know, that they're supposed to pass along the warnings of God so that they will obey him from generation to generation. He says, and if you look up at this, this part kind of fits within the what God brought on the Egyptians. And, you know, in terms of the 10 plagues, you kind of get a picture of that and what's happening here in verse four. What cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust eaten. So in other words, it tore up all of their, their food source that comes from plants. That's what the locust did. I mean, left them without basically any plant food source that was growing at the time. So then he talks, he, he brings it to the people. Awake, you drunkards, and weep. And well, all you drinkers of wine, because the sweet wine for it is cut off from your mouth. So the issue is drunkards aren't thinking straight, right? They're going their own way. They got their own thing going on. Well, he's talking about that, you know, these things are happening because they're not thinking or obeying rightly. So he says, for a nation has, now here, see, he brings a nation. So he doesn't leave it just to the locust. How do you define the locust problem? He says, for a nation has come up against my land powerful and beyond number its teeth are lion's teeth and it has the fangs of the of a lion now there are many speculations about the lion's issues here what is he talking about what is it that he's bringing about you know but the issue is the lion just symbolizes 
the top of the food chain, right? So in other words, you talk about a strong nation coming against them, basically one that they're not going to be able to stand against on their own. It has laid waste my vine. Remember, the vine is kind of a symbology that the Bible uses for his the chosen ones, like Israel, the vine, right? He has laid waste my vine and splintered my fig tree, the source. In other words, the source of fruit comes from the figs also. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it down without a bark, without bark, nothing, a plant can't survive. Their branches are made white. In other words, they dry up, right? Lament like a virgin wearing sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. So they're not adhering to the relationship that was there. It, it wasn't God, it, it, even in the church today, isn't Jesus the bridegroom of the church, the bride? And so in a sense, we also see that picture with God and the Jewish people. So he's saying the grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. In other words, they're not offering the required sacrifices to the Lord. They have basically, you know, gone their own way. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. In other words, the priests, I mean, if, if you look at it, are supposed to be the ones that are carrying out all these duties of the temple and bringing honor and glory to God. But yet it's not happening, so they're mourning. The fields are destroyed. The ground mourns because the grain is destroyed. The wine dries up. The oil languishes. Languishes. If you go back into Deuteronomy, you find it's God who provides all this. He's the one that makes your crops grow. He's the one that provides the early and the late rains. He's the one that makes everything happen if they will follow him. He makes that clear like from Deuteronomy 18 through 24. And if they don't do that, then their crops are going to die. They're, God's not going to do all these things that he would do taking care of them if they, like he would, if they would just follow him totally. So he says, be ashamed, O tillers of the soil, well, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. They've turned from the Lord. God has backed off. He's saying, well, if you can handle business on your own, okay, make it happen on your own. Let's see what happens. And in essence, it's not happening. OK, so in other words, if they back off from the Lord, in other words, they're not, you know, if you look at the first three of the Ten Commandments, it's all about them addressing God and who he is. They're to keep his name holy. They're to follow him only. They're to obey him. I mean, it, it's all about having that relationship with God and trusting God through it all and being surrendered to him and obedient to him. If they did that. Everything would be fine, but since they haven't been, we see what's happening here. The vine dries up, the fig tree languishes, pomegranate, palm, and apple. All the trees in the field are dried up, and gladness dries up from the children of man. Hey, if you can't eat or you're not getting your sustenance, are you going to be a, a, a pleasant people? Not likely. You're going to be bumming pretty heavily if you're not getting your daily bread, so to speak, right? So we see the warning is there. They've, they've done, they've turned from the Lord. They haven't been seeking him. God has backed off. They've been experiencing this stuff, but they still haven't returned to him. Okay, even though they're going through this, they're, they've got their eyes elsewhere and not on the Lord. So when, when Joel brings this litany of issues out against them to address the fact that they're not being where they need to be in their relationship with the Lord God, their God, the one who should be the one and only God. Look what he calls them to. Now, here's where we pick up from last week. He says in verse 13, put on sackcloth and lament, O priests. Well, O ministers of the altar. Now, when you look at Psalm um, is it 32 or 51, where he says, uh, let me just look real quick, because I just want to make sure that I'm giving you a straight skinny on this. Uh, it might be 32. Hang on. Oh, here it is. No, look what he says in Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite, O God, O God, you will not despise. See. In other words, you can turn a sacrificial system into a ritual, right? 
you can make it just something that really your heart's not in it. But well, God told me to do it, so I'm going to do it. But oh, well. But look, he says for, uh, in the verse prior, King David says, for you will not delight in sacrifice. Otherwise, I would, otherwise I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. In other words, the ritual part of it doesn't mean anything to God if they don't come to him with a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. In other words, humbled before the Lord because of our evil wanderings or our hearts not being right with him, unless we come to him surrendered like that, the, the offerings mean nothing. And so that's what Joel is talking about here when he's uh, referring to the fact that, you know, they need to well put on sackcloth and lament, O priest, and well, O ministers of the altar, because, I mean, the people need to come back to the Lord humbled and repentant of their the, their lifestyle, the what they're doing, of the gods they've been going after, what has upset the Lord. It, in other words, as they've gone their own way, they need to turn back to that, turn back to the Lord. But they need to do it in a sense of humility and and surrender to come back to the Lord with the right heart set with a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. And I'll tell you, we should be that way too in the Lord daily. When we pray to him, we should come to him humble with a broken spirit and a broken contrite heart before our God because, hey, we depend totally on him in everything. Yeah, so, can I, can yeah can go I ahead. Add that? Yeah, I'm reading in this new translation Bible, it has the masculine perspective. I always yeah. find it interesting. And it's to that point, it says, uh, when men try to get by with bare minimum of religion, God will not be impressed. He doesn't want token worship or partial obedience. He wants our whole heart. I think Amen. what you're saying is it's your heart. That's what matters. That's that's where it's at. Did you say that's the New Living Translation? Yes. Um, because I'm called. looking... This is the New Living Translation. Does it NL, sound... NL, NLT. Okay. That's what, Bible. That's what I'm at. I'm with the new NLT right here. Yeah, uh, I'm looking at I'm looking at Amos, the next one. I, I, I was just seeing if that would have any uh, Oh, oh, I see. I the, see. Joel. Yeah, I was yeah. Much out of Joel. Yeah, it's a, it, I mean, when you look at it, most of these minor prophets are doing exactly the same thing. They're warning and then they're telling how to fix it. You know, I mean, the issue is you have to come back to the Lord. And that's the fundamental issue across the board, kind of like what Aaron's even saying with Amos, for instance. So, I mean, that's why when you look at this, the ones that are the intercessors for the nation were the priests, right? Isn't that what the high priest would do? He'd go in and intercede once a year for the people in the Holy of Holies. And we also see that the priests were daily the ones that were offering the sacrifices for the people as they brought them in. And there were certain sacrifices that were just done at morning and at evening that were sin sacrifices and that for the people just in general that they were supposed to keep and continually do if you go back into Leviticus and look at that. So that's why it's important that when we come back to the Lord, we truly come back in humility. And as he says, and lament, be sorrowful, come back with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, coming back in humility before the Lord, before the altar of the Lord. The altar is the how we come into the presence of the Lord. The altar is where we confess our sins. Guess what? They were supposed to confess their sins back then, just like we are to do now, as 1 John 1, 9 says, right? First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, guess what? They were supposed to do the same, but they had a sacrificial system to go along with it. Whereas today, we lean into the grace because Jesus is our sacrifice today. And it's by grace that we come into him and confess our sin. And he's already forgiven us because he shed his blood for all sin for all time. So, and what he says, he continues on in verse 13. He says, go in, pass the night in sackcloth. Sackcloth was a way of saying you were humbling yourself before the Lord. Sometimes you hear it as ashes in sackcloth. 
Sackcloth is like gunny sack. Have you ever put gunny sack on his clothes? <laughs> I doubt any of you have uh, been that motivated to go out and find a gunny sack and get dressed in that. Like a burlap, a burlap bag. A burlap bag, yeah. <laughs> Imagine having that on. I mean, that would really look cool, I'm sure. Probably would be accepted as a, a dress norm today. But I'll tell you, gunny sack is not, it's itchy. It's it's very rough. It's basically something that is not comfortable in the least. So in other words, they're saying you're humbling yourself before the Lord by putting this on because you're not coming to it looking for comfort. You're coming to it uh, in a heart of surrender. And you don't mind that you're having to do discomfort as a matter of your sacrifice to be before the Lord who is righteous and godly before you. So that's why he's saying, that's why sackcloth plays in. We see lamentation playing in. That says that the heart is right before the Lord because we're lamenting our sinful natures, our problematic issues before the Lord. And we're coming to him because he is the only one who can forgive. He is the only one who can fix anything. He's the only one who can provide all this stuff. So he goes on, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of our God, okay? So in other words, what they're doing is they've been they've been saying, ah, it's not worth going to all the hassle of trying to do all this stuff because, well, does it really work or it doesn't work? It's kind of like the way we look at things today. Do we really have to do everything the Bible says today? And I'm, I'm talking more about New Covenant, New Testament issues. But do we really have to obey all that? Or is like that stuff for us from back in Jesus's time, that was 2000 years ago. And you'll hear many people say that was for the apostles when they didn't have a Bible yet. You know, I mean, it's not like everybody could carry a Bible around those days. So you don't have to worry about it today. That was for them then. It doesn't apply today. Well, I'll tell you, once you start saying that something in the Bible doesn't apply today in the sense of something that's, that has veracity and clearly is something that God has put out for all mankind to obey, and we know that those who don't know the Lord may not go that down that route, but the morality part of it is valid for all human beings, not just for Christians alone, but for all human beings, because, I mean, it's for it's for the good of humanity. OK, so when you look at that, he's saying that even those who are following God, these priests, even they aren't being committed to God like they're supposed to be. They're kind of doing what they want to do as much as they want to. But yet. You know, they're the ones that are supposed to be representing God. They're the ones that are supposed to be carrying out all of the sacrifices for the people. They're supposed to be carrying out the sacrifices in general for everybody, you know, every morning and every evening. If you back into Leviticus and read all the different sacrifices and which ones apply to the people in general and which ones the people can bring in that were specific to what they needed, maybe a sin offering of their own or a fellowship offering or a thanksgiving offering. There are a lot of different offerings that could be brought before the Lord, either individually or that God required as a collective whole for the people. Well, what Amos is saying, or I mean, Joel is saying here is that they're not keeping up with it the way they're supposed to. And I, I don't think God is referring to that as a legalism kind of thing. He's just saying your hearts aren't in it. You aren't, you know, I mean, if you loved me, isn't that what Jesus said? If you love me, you will keep my commandments, right? Well, God hasn't changed. It was the same for the Jews back then. God is saying, hey, if you love me, then obey me. Show me that you love me and that you really, truly do care. So, so we see that they've kind of held up. They haven't been keeping up with what they're supposed to do. But look what he calls them to do, though, to resolve the matter. He says, so consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Now, what is a fast? Who knows what a fast is? No supper, no lunch, no breakfast. No okay. Give up, give up eating for a period of time, right? Okay. But look at this. 
could I do a fast today that would not be pleasing to the Lord? Yeah. The answer to that is yes. For a diet reason as opposed to, uh, to honor God. Yeah. I mean, humble before him. Look at this. I'm going to take you to Isaiah 58 a minute. And listen to what he says. Oops, I, I should have put a chapter in there. Isaiah 58. Okay, look what God calls a, a fast. Cry aloud, do not hold back. In other words, be repentant before the Lord. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to the God. To do, they draw near to God. Why have we fasted? And you see it not. Now see, this is that legalism standpoint, right? Hey, look, we're, hey, we're doing everything right, but their hearts aren't in it. We've even fasted. And you're not answering, God. How come? What's up? Now look what he says in verse 3 and following. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Now we're going to find out what a fast is. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. In other words, so there is a wrong way to fast, right? If you go fast, but yet you're not doing really surrendering to the Lord, doing it because your heart is right with the Lord. You're doing it for your own pleasure. Look what he says. Behold, in the day you're fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. In other words, what have you done that's any different before the fast than while you're fasting? Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. In other words, <laughs> if you're just fasting out of ritual and you're not changing who you are, surrendering to the Lord, the fast means nothing to the Lord. It's kind of like what Joel is talking about. He's saying, hey, you know, you're doing all this stuff, but it means nothing to God for the priest. Now, he's not even talking about the people here. He's just, Joel is just talking about the priest. So he says, is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Now, it sounds like that might be a rhetorical question, but it's not. He says, is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast, uh, the day of acceptable to the Lord? What he's saying is you're doing it in a ritualistic way without any desire to change or any desire to come to God, to surrender to him and really truly repent. That's what a fast is for, is to repent and do what God wants. So he says, is not this the fast that I chose to lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? I mean, hey, when you look at that, it sounds like, man, what was it that they were supposed to do once every seven years? It was called the year of Jubilee. Remember in the year of Jubilee, they were supposed to free the slaves that they had, and they were supposed to make all, you know, basically cancel any bills against their own people. They were supposed to basically make everything clean again every year of Jubilee. It sounds just like that. In other words, in a fast, you should be looking out for the other person, helping them. He says, is it not to share your bread with the hungry? In other words, whatever you're fasting, give it to somebody else that's hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? Man, uh, you know, I mean, it sounds like fasting requires a lot of action and surrender and humility to God. He says, when you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. In other words, what are you doing for your people, God's people? He says, if you do all that, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your regard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. Boy. That puts it in perspective of what kind of fast God wants. It's not just about 
withholding food, there is action that needs to be taken in the process of the fast. It's part of being a servant to all. So, I mean, when you look at that and you understand that fasting better, it's clear that many people are doing it wrong if they are even fasting at all. They're doing it for their own gain, not for the welfare of others. But yet God is calling us to do it for the welfare of others. Yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. Yeah, and I would say that same principle will apply to our prayers. Amen. Yep. You know, because the Bible says if we have a, a, a situation with someone before we bring the offering, what are we supposed to do? Go so it's the same way. I mean, if we oppress people and we bad mouth people and sin against the Lord, guess what's going to happen to a prayer? They're going to be hindered. Yeah. And, and we're not going to necessarily get the answers the way we want them from our prayers. And See. that's exactly what's happening. So let's jump back to Joel and take a look at what he says here. Um, so. When he's talking about consecrating a fast and calling a solemn assembly, he's talking about the people coming to him with that Isaiah 58 mindset that we're going to humble ourselves before the Lord and we're going to reach out to those in need and we're going to help and we're going to be functional in terms of showing God's love through us to others in the process of our fast. So he's saying. This now, so Joel goes on, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. And we've seen this happen. Nehemiah did it. He brought all the people together to pray to the Lord. We see Ezra did it. We see after they came back from Babylon, we've seen others do it where they brought all the people. If you go to the time they were in the wilderness, they would always have the people come to the tabernacle. They would all surround the tabernacle, not going into it, but surrounding it, you know, to hear the word of the Lord. Well, in essence, that's what he's talking about. But the people's hearts need to be right so that they will cry out to the Lord. Another crying out to the Lord is a surrender. It is a humility matter of coming to the Lord and saying, we trust you, God. You know, it's kind of uh, as the scriptures say, you know, without him or, or, or with him, all things are possible. Without him, nothing is possible, right? I mean, we need the Lord in all that we do if it's going to be effective, but our hearts have to be right, just like Brother Martin said. I mean, if our hearts aren't right, what good are our prayers? They're going to bounce off the ceiling for all intents and purposes if we are doing it out of selfish motives, not out of surrendered servant heart reasons. So he's talking the same way. That's what Joel is talking about here. He's saying when you come to the Lord, cry out to the lord that's that's a car that's a cry of of repentance a cry of surrender a cry of saying you are god we totally need you so he says 15 alas for the day now you say well wait a minute what day is he talking about here well he's talking about the day of the lord okay um it, it's kind of like referring to those locusts above right he's talking about these issues that are going to be problematic to the land because they aren't following the Lord. So the day of the Lord is basically a day of judgment, whether it would be right away then, or it would be later in time, or it would be both. I mean, we've seen Israel has gone through a lot of judgment because they have not followed the Lord the way he's called them to follow him. And only, you know, the only times we've ever seen relatively good things happen in the Israel is when they had a good leader that followed the Lord. But when they didn't follow the Lord, we see that all kinds of problems always happen, regardless of what king they had in place. So he says, alas for the day, and in other words, the day of judgment, for the day of the Lord is near. And as destruction from the Almighty, it comes. So judgment is real. Now, I would venture to say that what Israel is experiencing right now is a day of the Lord. It is judgment. One of the things that you find God doing to bring people back to him is he lets things happen to them, difficult things. It even happens to us as Christians. Sometimes God will let us go through some tough times if we've been going our own way. He may, he may let us fall into consequences for our sins in such a way 
to where we, like the prodigal son, have to finally come to the end of ourselves and come back to him, come back to the father. You know what I'm saying? It's that kind of a situation. Well, with the Jews, that's how it was. I mean, God would back off and say, well, if that's the way you're going, let's see how you're going to handle this one that's coming your way. And so once they would get into a real predicament, guess what? All of a sudden, they would call on the Lord. Oh, God, help us, save us. You know, I mean, who are we? We can, we are your people. All of a sudden now, you know, we are your people. But as long as things are going good, they, they go their own way. But when things were going back, bad, all of a sudden, it's like, God, we're yours. How come you're letting this happen to us? What's up with that? And we have Christians today that do the same thing. Hey, God, if you love me, why are you allowing and fill in the blank? right? Well, the issue is maybe sometimes we need to look at ourselves a little closer. Yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. Yeah, and, to, and it's sad to say that a lot of Christians, they don't even know God. They don't well, realize that, you know what? True. Every every sin needs to be punished by God because it's a rebellion against God. Right. So even though we ask for forgiveness, there are going to be consequences. And there are time God, you know, God uses different circumstances basically to, to, to uh, take care of us. Uh, there are things that, that we that God want, that we have to deal with in our lives, right? And we go through, but there are consequences that they are going to come through. And and again, every sin needs to be punished. Amen. Yeah, and I mean, we we rely we rely on God, you know, through Jesus Christ, to be the one who is who when we truly repent when we truly say yes lord that's i that's not me that guy that sinned you know i want to be who you would have me be uh, I, repentance goes a long way but there are many consequences that are going to result from sin that's just what sin is about sin is not good for us it's not good for the human uh because when we sin we go against god's order of things and remember i said in the intro hey if don't you think the creator knows what's best for his creation and that he knows what is right in the order of things for those he created? Yeah, Cher, go ahead. Okay, um, so are we supposed to like take everything literally uh, that we read in the Bible? Because you already mentioned, and I've ar already brought this up, I think, in the past. I have a real problem with, um, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Right. So if we're taking this literally, since we're all sinners, then they're trying to say we don't love Jesus because we're breaking the commandments because we're sinning. And I have a real problem with that because just because I'm a sinner doesn't mean I don't love Jesus with all my heart, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but if you read that literally, it says that if you're sinning and you're, you know, breaking the commandments that you don't love him. Okay. No, what Jesus was saying there, and we need to understand grace when we read the Bible. Because if you don't understand grace, you'll interpret it like you're saying. You're because then you're looking at it from human eyes that say, hey, there's a there's a just payback if you don't do it my way. So hey, do you think that Jesus knew that you, Cher, were going to sin when he saved you and gave you his saving grace? Absolutely, right? But he did it anyway. See, that's grace. He already knows us. I mean, when he saves us, he knows all the sin we're going to have to commit before we go to be with him. And yet he loves us so much that he saves us anyway. It's his doing. That's why we can't boast and say it was my doing that look how good i was to come to my you know into a relationship with jesus no all we do is just surrender to him and say i can't do it i need you because i can't right and none of us can because like you said we all sin if you look at first john he says that if you say you were without sin you make god a liar and he is talking to believers okay that's john is talking to believers in that case so the reality is, yes, we do sin. When Jesus made the statement, you know, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. What he's saying is that I am going to be most important in your life. And you're going to do, you're going to work with me to walk in righteousness. And 
if you look at what Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, he says, if you walk by the spirit, you won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. Well, what we find is we can't do it on our own. We've got a sinful proclivity within us. I mean, that's part of what we inherited in the gar from the Garden of Eden. We all inherited that original sin. And regrettably, when we come into Christ's saving grace, that doesn't go away. That curse is not removed from us. So that struggle, if you read all of Galatians 5, you'll find that it's a daily struggle that we have. It's the flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And, you know, if you look at the end of uh, Romans 7, Paul talks about that, what I, that which I want to do, I don't do. And that which I do is... You know, it's like, what's wrong with me? You know, what wretched man that I am. In other words, I want to walk in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to be obedient to his commandments. But what's wrong with me? This flesh is still problematic. But then he transitioned into Romans 8, 1, right? There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk by the spirit, not after the flesh, right? I mean, it is still about depending on him. And will we sin? Regrettably, yes. I'm not saying it's the lifestyle that we want or that we should pursue, because that's what the Romans 6, 1 thing talks about. You know, some people think, oh, I can just sin all I want. Well, Paul said, should I go on sinning all the more so that grace all the more can abound? God forbid. So it's not about, you know, some kind of loophole in following the Lord or walking in righteousness. It's about trusting him and walking in his way by his strength and his power. And will we fail at times? Yes. But Pastor Jimmy gave a message and he said, one of the things that you'll find as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in you is that when you sin, you're not going to enjoy it. Bless you. And so when you look at that, <laughs> when you look at that, I mean, Jimmy's right. The Holy Spirit will not let us enjoy a sinful nature in our lives that he wants us to walk, that God wants us to walk in. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Mark. Well, the difference is, I would say, uh, for those that are not Christian, they are trying to please God with their deeds. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a good guy because I go to church every day. I don't do harm to anyone. So they trust in on themselves, right? Right. But for us as a Christian, we, are, we know we're not perfect. We are still sinner. But guess what? We are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Like you said, there's no more condemnation for us. Amen. We are set free. Amen. So even when we sin, we have an applicate. We, we, we go to Christ and we ask Amen. for forgiveness. So our trust is not what we could do, but what, God has, what Christ has done for us. And, that, and that's the distinction. Amen. And another thing is, we don't practice sin. And if we, we fall... We still go, to, you know, we trust in, in the sacrifice that Christ has done on the cross. Amen. We never rely on ourselves. Amen. And that, that's, that's the difference. Are, are we going to obtain perfection in the, on this earth? No, we're not going to. Yeah. That, but we're being sanctified every day. Amen. Amen. That's the Holy Spirit's work. And that's in the Holy us, Spirit. So. Yeah, not us. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Good synopsis, Martin. I mean, he captured it really well, Cher. So, just remember that. Just keep trusting in the Lord. Keep your eyes on him. Because, I mean, judgment does fall and does happen, right? And that's why he talks about here in verse 15. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. Anytime he talks about this, that means judgment is going to, going to happen. Now, notice he doesn't say a specific one, but he says, it's near. So it may be once, it may be more than once, that this judgment is going to fall on the Jewish people, on Israel. And as destruction from the Almighty, it comes. In other words, when that judgment falls, there will be destruction. Okay? Now, let me ask you a question. With this situation that's going on in Israel right now, has there been destruction? I would say so. Now, think about this. Is Hamas a nation? No, exactly. Hamas is not a nation. They are a collective group of people that have very uh, 
they have different views, very radical views within the Muslim realm that have come together. Now, they come from all different nations and, you know, Muslim nations and make up these groups, whether it's the ISIS group, whether it's the Hamas group or any of those other groups. But they're backed by certain or various of these Muslim nations. And we've already heard some of the Arabic nations already touting, you know, and this hasn't just been recently, but it's been out there that they want Israel wiped off the face of the map. They just don't see Israel as contributing anything to the world whatsoever, and they should be gone. They are infidels, and they should be gone, according to the Quran. And these radical Muslims that have come together in these groups, whether Hamas, ISIS, or others, they are trying to carry that out in any way they can. Now, I see the same thing happening from what Joel is talking about here. They, the Israel community, has deviated from following God. They've gone their own way. Now, some would say, oh, no, they're just living in a more modern world, and that's just how it is in the world today. Hey, sorry, God, you can't, you can't give that excuse to God and say that it's okay. Either you follow God and you trust him or you don't. And regrettably, these days, they don't truly follow or trust God that way. You don't hear them ever saying, you know, our God and holding fast at a nation level or anything like, you know, there were certain kings that would do. Hezekiah was one that held a nation fast, for instance. You don't see anything like that in the Jewish community these days. Um, so I, I really feel that we're seeing in a sense, when it says this nation will come, great nation will come against you, in a sense, what you're seeing is that these groups are backed by all of the Muslim nations at some level, not all of them. I don't want to stereotype and say that every Muslim person is, you know, just totally evil and wants to, you know, take out uh, Israel or the United States. But, you know, there are the radical extremists that do. They see it that way, and they are the ones that make up these groups that have come against Israel. Now, has God used groups or nations against Israel before? Yeah, he sure has. And I'll tell you what, uh, to me, it, it wouldn't surprise me if that's exactly what God is doing here, trying to get Israel's attention. Now, Will any of these organizations, these groups or nations coming against Israel ever fully eradicate Israel or tear them down? No, because God already promised that he's not going to let anyone basically do take them off the map. He's already has a God already has a covenant with Abraham and he's going to carry that part out. So in all of these coming against Israel are going to fail. I'm not saying that they may not inflict damage to Israel or kill people, but they will fail. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, it isn't the, the, their, their primary goal of anyone that's not Islamic faith, they want to, or any nation, they want to get rid of us. So it's not just Israel. I think they're after Israel and all other Christians. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because the Quran in, in one of the surahs says that uh, and all infidels should be killed. Right. And, and well, the Bible doesn't say America is going to be around. <laughs> well, it doesn't really mention the Americas at all, North or right. South America. Yeah. At the time, they didn't even know of this other, you know, set of continents out here on this side. All they knew was that part of the world that was around Israel, basically, if you think about it, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah. So when you look at this, yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. And for those ignorant out there, are ignorant, I should say, that are backing up the Hamas, infidel, it means all of us. We oh, all yeah. infidel. <laughs> and, and, and you know, unless you're Muslim, oh yeah, where's the yeah, uh, they are they are protesting against basically those crip I mean, in favor, I should say, of those criminals, because that's what they are, right? You know, because of ignorance. Yeah, you think that uh, I mean they they so ignorant that they think if they go out there, oh, I'm in your side, they're gonna be safe. 
these people don't have no mercy. No, no. No, the radicals don't. And and I just want to make a distinction there against the radicals and the mainstream Muslim. The mainstream Muslim, for the most part, is a peaceful people. But the radicals are not. They take very literally certain parts of the Quran and they want to carry it out. Hey, 9-11 is a good example, right? They didn't care. You know, they just wanted to take us out. See, they've described this. These radical elements describe us as the big Satan, Israel as the little Satan. <laughs> and they think they're going to kill Satan. Well, maybe, maybe they need to look in the mirror, you know. But <laughs> anyway, uh, those are the type of situations that we're dealing with in the world today. And I tell you, I, I, I guarantee that Satan is involved at some level. He's influencing. And that's what's going on. But at the same time, though, God still wants us to follow him. And if we don't, we're outside of his protection. Yeah, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, you know, uh, you, you have to wonder their wisdom or their rationality of how they think. Because even, in, uh, have you seen all these uh, so-called smart uh, professors in these big fancy colleges coming out and saying how evil and some Jew Jews are, are Israel right. pigs? Right. These are supposed to be some of the more educated people. <laughs> yeah. But they have no, I guess they just don't have, is it lack of wisdom or I, I, how can a normal brain think that way i think so what is it obviously it's got to be a, another force right yeah yeah well Just, i think oh i'm sorry aaron go ahead no i'm done okay. yeah i got charlie with me i got uh, all oh, right hey no, say hi to charlie for us aaron we'll do he's <laughs> such a good baby yeah awesome hey i'll tell you one of the, the big problem here with like a lot of these scholars and, you know, professors and, you know, millionaires that are out there that somehow get a voice amongst people just because they have a bunch of money or politicians or whatnot that make these statements. I hate to say it, but the majority of them are making them from a human understanding viewpoint. And they're only using human wisdom. See, they're not leaning into a godly wisdom. And that's where the difference comes in. When you lean into a godly wisdom, you, you draw on the power of God, the creator of the universe. And through the Holy Spirit, he gives you the right things to say. And you're not going to say these things like they are saying. From a humanly wisdom standpoint, hey, I hate to say it, but the sky's the limit as to what they may say or what conclusions they may draw from their knowledge base. They're drawing it strictly from a human base and a human perspective, which means that they're under the influence of the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. And so that's why they say what they say. And that's why they come to the conclusions they come to, because they're not using a godly way of thinking. They're using a human way of thinking, which is influenced under the prince of the power of the air. And why, why aren't all these people being called out and uh, instead they're allowing them to c c uh, retract or apologize, but they don't lose their job or anything. There's no, there's no account counting, you know, the media covers for them. Right. It's just yeah. amazing. It's sad. I mean, I, I don't know how best to put it, Aaron, but yeah, I mean, it shows that we as a humanity have, have problems, big problems that we allow things like that and like it's okay to say it and oh don't worry about what the ramifications are hey if you retract it it's okay well, once it's out there it's out there you can retract it all you want but they they accomplished what they set out to do which was get the word out there you know once it's said it's said yeah it's crazy aaron it sure is. Even, uh, Talib, who knows that uh, they're reporting the hospital was one of their their own uh, Hamas missiles. Right. And, uh, even though that that that, that's, that information's out, she doesn't believe it. She's still acting like the yeah. Israel is Israel is. Well, that's because she's already got a philosophical viewpoint that's locked in. 
And she's going to take that no matter what, because that's the way she is going down. That's the way she sees everything. She only sees it from one perspective. She's not open to correction. She's not open to anything other than her viewpoint. And that's just called being stubborn. Where, where's the DNC? You know, uh, I, guess I have no idea. They, <laughs> but they Marjorie Taylor Greene, they, they kicked her out of the, all the committees. So yeah, just, yeah. It's all the crazy. Ones. Yeah, sadly, we have some people that need some serious oversight, don't we? And they are leading our country, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. So, yeah, so it is. So we know that the day of judgment is coming. We're seeing it happen even now. And I guarantee you that there will be an outcome from this situation that's going on out there right now. OK, and it will be there for a reason. God is letting it happen for a reason. So don't don't ever look at that as, oh, it's just a crazy thing that's happening. No, I guarantee you that biblically it has foundational purpose under God's plan for Israel. And yes, people are going to die. Yes, it's not going to be pretty. But at the end of it, God will work out his plan because we know that at the end, Israel will turn back to the Lord. But unfortunately, as long as they keep pushing God away, they're going to go through these types of situations. And God will use whatever he needs to use to carry out his plan of purpose. And we've seen that throughout scripture. He uses all kinds of nations and situations to try to bring Israel back to himself when they kept straight. Well, and that's what he's talking about, the destruction of the Almighty. It comes. And verse 16, is not the food cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of the Lord. In other words, when judgment comes, it has a, there's a price to pay. And people aren't going to always be happy. Look at Israel right now. Man, they are in an uproar against their government about, hey, you guys weren't ready. You weren't looking out for us. Why did you let this happen? What's going on with you guys? There's no joy and gladness in the nation right now, right? And what are they doing about seeking God from the house of our God? They're not, we don't hear anything about them saying, hey, we want to humble ourselves before God. Not yet anyway. So he says in verse 17, the sea shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate. The grain rays are torn down because the grain is dried up. And how the beasts grow. The herds of cattle are perplexed because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. Now, right now, I don't see that judgment is hitting these areas for the nation. But, hey, because look at what we're doing. We're not only providing help to the folks at Gaza. We provide a lot of money there, but we're also providing help to Israel. So these things were there to help them keep from some of the overt things, you know, being problematic to them. In other words, we're providing them enough money if they use it well, that hopefully they'll use it for medical and food purposes. But, you know, hey, that doesn't mean they're going to. They may use it to buy more weapons, you know. <laughs> But the bottom line is, we see that there are consequences to them not surrendering to the Lord. When God's judgment comes, are they going to obey him or are they going to suffer the consequences like Brother Martin was saying? So look what look how uh, Joel ends up this prophecy, this part of the prophecy. He says to, in verse 19, to you, O Lord, I call for fire has devoured the pastors of the wilderness and flame has burned all the trees of the field. That's judgment. Fire is judgment, okay? Even the beasts of the field plant for you or pant for you because the water books are dried up and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. So as we look at this part, what the Lord is calling them to all comes to an issue right here in verse 14. What they're supposed to do is well look at 13 also put on sackcloth and lament right they're to humble themselves before the lord they are you know the ministers of god the priests are to come to the people and come with offerings of the right kind before the lord right a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart they are to consecrate a fast the right kind of fast in the solemn assembly that we read in isaiah 58 they need to come to him and surrender. Guess what? Do you think that this advice applies today too? 
Absolutely. If they would humble themselves before God, I guarantee you that you would see a change in that situation over there in the world right now. I guarantee you it would. But if they don't, they're going to go through all the other consequences that Joel explains here through the end of the chapter. And so, and, and unfortunately, that's where we see them at at this point, okay? Now, next week, we'll pick up and talk about the day of the Lord, the day of judgment, the day that, you know, judgment does come, that judgment does fall. Yeah, Martin, go ahead, brother. Yeah, I mean, it's sad to say, but even to us, the, to the situation that Israel is going through, I don't hear they mention the, the uh, God anywhere. Not once. I don't hear they mention Jehovah. Yeah. You know, the, the God of Abraham. Amen. Amen. Oh, the God of Isaac. Amen. Jacob. Oh, I don't hear anything. Nothing. And that's why I'm saying, you know, I mean, I think eventually they're going to have to come to a point where they have to call on the Lord. I mean, because, mm -hmm. uh, hey, God's just going to stand back and let judgment fall. Now, he won't let them be destroyed. But, hey, destruction doesn't mean that they're not going to, you know, uh, go through some tough times. Judgment is falling. And they're going to go through right. what the results of that judgment are from yeah. God. Yes, yeah, I Aaron, go ahead, brother. Like in the Old Testament, they want to be like the other nations. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah, we are going to look alike. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah, Aaron. I think I just heard uh, Abram, Abraham, he was a Gentile. Yep. He came from Ur of the Chaldees. Yeah. Uh huh. He was a Chaldean. So he started off as a Gentile. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I, I didn't know that. I just learned that this week. Oh yeah, yeah. He yeah he was from the Ur of the Chaldeans, and uh, he and his whole family. I mean, there were no Jews at the time. There was no chosen people. So I mean, the right. only one it could come from was technically a Gentile. All the world was Gentile technically at that point. And he was a worshiper of idols. Oh yeah, his whole family was. Yeah, they brought their idols with him from Ur of the Chaldees up to Haran, which is about central uh central southern turkey today yeah yeah we had a teacher that used to say why did god choose abraham to be the first jew because he wanted to and that's it it was <laughs> god's decision it was his choice but then again why did god choose you and me to come into his saving grace that's right because he wanted to right <laughs> right <laughs> amen amen so praise god for that i'll tell you what okay any yeah, questions and, comments agreements you know, a lot of people yeah a lot ahead, of people question themselves you know what why israel or what you know what's so good about israel why <laughs> why why them well like aaron was saying uh abraham he was no special man right no. when he got chosen but got God promised him that out of him, he was going to make a nation, right? Amen. There's nothing to see. People always focus on on human uh, reaction or, or human uh, deeds. No, it's the other way around. We can't focus on God. Amen. Amen. Because it's all for the glory of God. Amen. So it's not. It's not because Abraham was a, a great person. He was not. That's a matter of fact. He was a liar, right? <laughs> How many times did he lie? Twice, right? Yeah, I know. About, about his wife. About, yeah. his, about his wife. Yeah. So the, the glory doesn't belong to him. It Amen. belongs to God. Amen. Absolutely. God is amazing. He is awesome. Did, did Abraham get, uh, offer his wife to the Egyptians? Is that what he said? Well, he didn't. He didn't go against it. He basically just said, "Tell them, you know, that you're my sister." And so when the Pharaoh took her. Uh, Abraham kept his mouth shut. It was God who had to intervene <laughs> and get Pharaoh to realize, hey, you're you're dead man. As a matter of fact, that's how the Bible puts it. You're a dead man if you lay your hand on that woman, basically. <laughs> so if it were for God, hey, he, 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 
the pharaohs yeah, because according according to the to the story you know she was a, a she was a beautiful woman oh yeah yeah she was very beautiful and that's why abraham was scared he's like hey tell her you're my sister because i don't want to die he goes hey somebody wants to take you from me <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Now, isn't that amazing love that Abraham had for his wife? <laughs> oh. oh, Lord. Right yeah. That's that's how it goes, right? That's us humans. We can we've got our issues, don't we? Right. And that tells you it was it was uh, his, it shows his character right there. OK, yeah, yeah. yeah. So his sure character does. wasn't so great because no. another man was saying, you know what? That's my wife. Make sure you don't touch her. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? You do basically what you want. Yeah. He was looking out for himself. He was. And God had to rescue her both times from Abraham's faux pas. Yeah. yeah. So it happened twice, if I'm twice. not mistaken. Yeah. But yeah. then obviously his faith got huge because he was going to sacrifice yeah. his son. Oh, he did trust God. Yeah, that was one thing Abraham did. He trusted God. I, in a sense, you might say he trusted God to make sure that he God looked out for Sarah when he when he oh. gave her up. <laughs> uh, so Isaac, old enough, Isaac could have easily not allowed his father to do that. I think it took both of them. Oh yeah, no, I mean I think Isaac, Isaac. I mean because when Isaac asked him, "Where is the sacrifice, father?" And Abraham told him, son, God will provide. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, hey, he put him on the altar, put the son on the altar, put the wood under him and everything. I mean, the kid already had a pretty good inkling. He was toast, okay? But yet... Well, which which one had greater faith? The dad, which is doing the killing. Right. Or the son who was just going to lie down there and let and him obey dad, yeah, without being right. restrained. I think anybody would have to be restrained generally. Yeah, uh, well, but you know, God stopped them just in time, right? Yeah. But also, I think in those days, let me tell you, it, uh, sons they didn't did have not, much choice. Did not okay? disobey yeah, their it's father. Not, it's not the same the same way that we we yeah, raise our today. kids today. Yeah, whatever the father said, it went. Yeah. But I do agree. I still think that he gave in a lot. He didn't run away. <laughs> oh yes, I got it. There's a, uh, yeah. a philosopher out there. See, we take it, we take it, we read that and we say, ah, oh, that was so easy. <laughs> Let me tell you. Right. There's, there's a philosopher out there that's, that goes into detail of obviously he gets his opinion. But he yeah. said, he said, Abraham did not sleep that night. He yeah. was dwelling, he was turning, he was, you know, he was going to to a uh, turmoil. Yeah, because imagine having that the day before, right? Having that news, and tomorrow morning you're gonna sacrifice your son. That's exactly what what, yeah. what God asked for him. Right. So he didn't know. Now we know the end of the story. It's easy. Oh, yeah, to yeah. Read that now. Yeah, of course it's easy. But put yourself in. You know, put if we put ourselves in his shoes, that guy is telling us. We say we are in his shoes, and guy's telling us tomorrow you're gonna sacrifice your son. You don't question God. Right, he didn't. He didn't question what, but, but, but no. He said, "Okay, tomorrow I'm going to go and do it." So and I guarantee the outcome that got that got basically stopping. But yeah. he was ready to do it. Yeah, that's why, it, you know, his face was he, his faith was strong. Was tested. Yeah, he's yeah. yeah. God's friend. Amen, amen. And I'll tell you what, I guarantee you that Abraham did not tell Sarah. <laughs> he just took Isaac and went because. I think Sarah would have fought. You are not taking my son. <laughs> the extra, uh, a mother's love. Friction, yeah. You know? yeah. Okay, any other questions, comments, agreements, disagreements We will before we go into prayer time? Okay. Let's stop the recording here.